Hey everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Sham and I uh, work with the Mozilla ID team. And we're just going to take a look at uh, how Mozilla does uh, handles our infrastructure. Uh, feel free to stop me for questions in between or if you want to hold it at the end, that's fine too. <laughs> that's uh, that's the TLDR of this thing. Uh, a lot of the stuff that he spoke about was, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but a lot of the stuff we do is pretty similar and the tools we use are pretty similar, so I thought that would be slightly apt. Uh, a little uh, history or a little snippet about Mozilla. We uh, helped make Firefox, which used to be the second most used browser, and we're now between second and third, I guess. Uh, we've got about 500 million users as of last year, or mid this year. And uh, I'll switch over to the history of the IT team just to give you uh, some sense of scale. Uh, back in 2005, when the Mozilla Corporation was actually formed, they had one sysadmin who's still with us today. His name is Just Dave, and he was the only guy who ran all of Mozilla IT. And when I joined Mozilla in June 2009, I was the 10th member and the first one outside of the US to be part of the team. Today we have 45 people, and there's another colleague of mine here, Ashish, who's based in India. And so yeah, we have 45 guys handling all of the IT stuff. Uh, what are the various themes we have and how we split up responsibilities? Uh, desktop basically handles all the office support, you know, day-to-day -day stuff, imaging, laptops, handing out stuff to people, fixing, hey, my disk doesn't want, or my laptop got stolen, kind of issues. Uh, systems is primary, uh, systems is but the team I'm part of, and it's primarily responsible for pretty much all the web website, web front end operations of Mozilla. Uh, we also are involved in a lot of the architectural decisions on how to scale websites, uh, databases, and so on. Operations are contain a bunch of our site reliability engineers, who are basically the on call guys, triaging the bug queues, making sure everything's you know fixed if it's broken. Uh, NetOps, as, it, as the name suggests, is network operations. Uh, we've got a team of about four or five guys who handle network operations across our seven data centers and multiple offices. Services operations was uh, spun off from systems, uh, from the systems team to basically handle sync. That's an entire team that looks after sync. Now they're also starting to look, up, look after services like browser ID and stuff. And special operations, we're a little jealous about that name that they picked that. Uh, basically, uh, they interface with the release engineering team and they're primarily responsible for helping build Firefox, make sure they've got enough hardware to test and stuff like that. Uh, what exactly uh, do we do? So. Um, a bit, or quite a bit it seems. So we have a pretty large and complex environment and we're responsible for getting that all set up and going without any issues. Um, these are where we have our data centers. San Jose was, I think, our first data center. We still have two cages of equipment on two different floors. Phoenix is the data center. We moved into uh, beginning of 2010. This was to this was to enable us to have a failover place in case San Jose went down. So the little funny story there was every time the uh, so uh, I don't know if any of you people know about Market Postar. It's a pretty famous uh, data center in San Jose, and every time the city of San Jose had a function or a public festival or something of that sort, the pressure on the water main lines dropped below a certain level. So they couldn't pump enough water up to the 16th floor. So all our not here, all the servers would overheat and shut down one after another. And this happened like I think at least thrice in a year. And we said, okay, we've had enough of this. You know, we're gonna move out of there. So that's how Phoenix came along. And uh, Santa Clara, we have two data centers in operation. One is being built, 
They do that in an operation almost uh, are solely responsible for all of the build stuff. Uh, a little bit of branching into what building <laughs> Firefox means is basically every time there's a check-in to the Firefox source tree, um, it's collected and it's sent to a build slave and it gets built across multiple platforms starting from Mac, Windows, Linux, 32-bit, 64-bit, Fedora, I think they do want to, but I'm not sure about that. So all of these builds, or a bunch of these builds happen on Mac minis. The reason being you can't run Mac legally on anything else, but you can run other operating systems on a Mac. I unfortunately forgot to put in pictures, but yeah, so what we do uh, is, so, mm, You've got a bunch of builds happening, and then you've got performance tests that run on these machines, and then developers get an email if the, if the current build is X percentage slower than the previous build. So they know that their check-in actually caused a performance issue. So a bunch of those machines are sitting in the two data centers in Santa Clara. The second one is actually all of Sync. All of your Sync, a bunch of that Sync stuff is in Santa Clara and Phoenix. And the third data center that will go live Feb next year is our biggest data center so far, and we'll probably move completely out of San Jose into that place. Amsterdam was basically a proxy uh, area for us to serve your users in Europe, so it's not much. Beijing exists because we have to serve content to China from within China, so it's pretty expensive. Bandwidth is to the order of about two fifty dollars per MB per. You don't really have a choice, you have to serve content from there. These are also the list of offices that we support. Yeah, there was only Mountain View, Beijing, and Paris until last year, and Vancouver as well. And then Toronto moved into a new place. We have this new concept called Spaces where we allow a portion of the office uh, to be given away to the community. You can come in and work on open source projects or on Mozilla projects and stuff that's still you know, in the works. Tom, a quick question. Sure. You did say that all your build machines are a cluster of Mac Minis. Yeah, not exactly a cluster, but individual yeah, machines. Them. How many of them? Yeah, I will run to this. Yeah, just, no, just how many of them and what's the performance? Just ran out of... Push it up. Ran out of that. Okay, so... No, it's gone off over there. Put it on. Just press the light. Yeah, you could go. Give it a second, it'll come out. Yeah. Okay, so Jace's question was you said your build machines are Mac minis. <coughs> and how many of them and what's the performance like? How many of them and what is the performance like? Um, <laughs> off the top of my head, I would say we have about anywhere between 300 to 150 to 200 Mac minis. I have, I think I have a picture on my yeah, phone. Yeah, dig it up. You. That would be a fabulous picture. Yes, I, I definitely have a picture on my phone. I'll show it to you uh, after this. And uh, when you mean performance, what exactly are you talking about? <laughs> it looks like the doubts are some questions too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When, when you talk about performance, what exactly are you looking So, the thing is, see, if you're using a Mac Minis to build for Windows and Linux, are you getting the equivalent performance of using a server? So, I think the reason they do that is it's the same hardware, so the baseline is the same. Okay. Which means if you have a dual core machine with that processor, that much of RAM across three operating systems, you have a baseline figure of Firefox performance. It might not be super accurate, but it's one way of measuring okay. how that works. So, a bunch of numbers just to throw in some numbers. We've got about, we, we definitely have over 4,000 machines. A uh, good majority of these are hardware. There are also, this also includes the minis and the VMs that we have. Uh, HP is what most of our hardware is. We have also an interesting thing called the C-Micro, which is basically a 10 new box. But uh, we've, got two, we've got one version of it in production, which is basically 512 atoms and they can all be used as individual machines. So a bunch of our websites run on 100 Atom nodes, and that's it. We just assign 100 nodes and say, you serve these 30 websites, and it pretty much does a pretty good job. Your websites might be a little slow, but 
for not not for traffic for sites that do not attract that much traffic that works just fine. IX, uh, we have a few machines that are used for release engineering work. Uh, we also own VMs, a bunch of those are VMware. Um, we also started a new VMware cluster in Phoenix. A bunch of that is also KVM based, so we do both of that and it all depends. And of course, Mac minis are, are release engineering stuff. And just randomly, we do about 40,000 Nagios checks, hosts and services included across data centers. I'm not sure offices are included in that number, so might not be super accurate. Our operating system is RHEL, as much as we don't like RPMs. <laughs> the biggest reason for going with RHEL was uh, hardware support, in case we run into issues. I think we've run into like maybe one issue, or one and a half issue in the last five, six years that we really had to lean on HP and Red Hat to fix. And uh, one of them was related to a network driver on one of the load balancers and stuff. So it, it does help at times to have that kind of support. So that's the reason we stick, we stick to it. Most of our machines are uh, on six already, and the rest of them are five. Uh, there are There is a smattering of a few Ubuntu machines and a few CentOS machines. I think a lot of the sync stuff runs uh, CentOS, but not really sure. Uh, so what are these machines, why do we need so many machines? So a bunch of these machines are used for web heads. Add-ons is right up there on the list because that's our, that's the site that gets the most traffic for us. Uh, we get about 25,000 hits per second on the site on a normal day. This goes up uh, when we have Firefox releases. And uh, so this is served by a cluster of about, if I remember right, 30 machines in Phoenix. And it's fronted by seven load balancers. I'll talk about the load balancers in the next slide and what exactly we do with them. Bugzilla is another pretty high traffic site for us. Like We use it a lot and a lot of the community interactions and stuff happen on Bugzilla. Um, that is, I think, four web heads. So it's, it, just to give you a scale comparison, it's pretty much the same hardware on both, but Bugzilla doesn't see that much traffic. Support is again, I think, three or four web heads. Input is, uh, it's a very beta product thing for feedback. That's an input product URL, so people can just click and submit stuff. We also have, ooh, there's a typo, web tools, not web tools. Uh, MXR is this uh, interesting thing called, it's basically, it stands for Mozilla Cross Reference. Uh, it basically indexes every line of code we have. It basically indexes, I'm, I think they want us to index Chromium code as well and other processes, other code that's available. It also indexes all of add-ons code and if you go to the site mxr.mozilla.org, you can enter a string that's available in code and it'll give you all the source files that have that in them. So you can quickly look up, hey, where, where is this function being called? across what properties. So if you make a change, you can quickly see what it affects. Another important tool that we use is Socorro. Uh, that's what it's called internally. It's, your, it's that tool that pops up when your Firefox crashes. <laughs> and the internal joke in IT is we wouldn't have to spend so much money on that if we built a product that wouldn't crash. But yeah, we all know how that goes. It's a pretty awesome site, and it's, it's easily uh, the stuff we have the most hardware behind. We have about 70 Hadoop nodes behind this. We've got a bunch Thanks, of... Crash stats? Yeah, crash stats, yes. A lot of the, stat, uh, the... He asked if it was for crash stats, yes. A lot of the crashes are stored on HDFS and then pulled out for processing and then pushed back in. And we also have our biggest database cluster, which is like a 24 core, 72 gig machine. Two of those running Postgres for Socorro, and yeah, most of the most of the web heads they've got. I think they've got six web heads. Each of them are 12 GB RAM machines, real beasts. And the main thing that we look at is we don't lose any crashes. It doesn't matter if the processing stops. It doesn't matter if something else fails. But if a user is not able to submit a crash report to us, that's a big that's a big problem. So we even have Nagios checks automatically submitting crashes. So if something doesn't submit, then we get alerted and look at it. Um, most
most of our web servers on Apache, I'd say 99.99% is Apache. Uh, we've recently, uh, our web dev teams have started, well, somewhere in the middle of last year, or the year before, early 2010, they started moving away from PHP to uh, Django and Python. So we use a lot of ModWSD. Uh, ModPerl FCGI is only there for Bugzilla, pretty much. I don't think any of our, and maybe MXR, and some of the web tools, PHP. There's uh, still add-ons, uh, the web website is still convert. It's still running half Django, half PHP. So it's still in the mode of getting transferred over to uh, Python. So that's why we have more than PHP. Nginx is there because uh, hg.mozilla.org, or Mercurial repository, or all the hits on HTTP and HTTPS on that go directly to Nginx, which then branches out where it has to send it. It was just set up that way. It will probably change, and we will probably not do Nginx in the future when we be architect that. Um, I'll go from the bottom here. Uh, we used to use Netscalers uh, when I joined. We quickly moved away from that to Zeus. Uh, the reason being, well, it's now called Stingray, which we don't like. Zeus was way cooler. But the reason was for that was you could run, it's basically, it runs on Linux, so you could just put stock hardware, unlike the Netscaler, which you had to buy the appliance. You just put this on stock hardware, and you scale hardware, you can scale Zeus, performs pretty well. And uh, so yeah, the, the Netscaler was what we moved away from. The initial installs of this Zeus needed the Cisco Ace in front of it, because it had some issues with uh, connections and how it handled them. So we had to put the application, whatever, engine from Cisco. We had enough bugs with that as well, and it would randomly fail over. There were a lot of issues. And we recently, is there a question over there? Okay. We recently had um, issues with the Zeus as well. That was because of the hardware we were running on it. We hit limits on that, on the network interfaces. So we have sort of figured out that we need 10 gig links and stuff. And so it's pretty nice to configure and use. It's pretty simple, and it just pretty much works most of the time. Uh, I just lumped in LDAP there because it was like easier to talk about it. A lot of our, uh, let's just say, company information, logins, etc., depend on LDAP. So LDAP is something that's available in all our data centers and offices. MySQL is what we use, most of our websites use, like I would say at this point, more than 95% of our websites use MySQL. We've got various clusters and different SLAs. Right now, they're all pretty much uh, master-slave configurations, but we recently hired uh, Shiri Cabral, who's a pretty good person with MySQL, so we're going to start moving stuff to master-master setups and things like that. PostgreSQL, our internal Confluence wiki uses PostgreSQL, as well as, um, yeah, so called, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, uses PostgreSQL. And of course, we have Hadoop. Uh, I think our metrics team uses Hadoop for doing log analysis. Again, I think our usage of Hadoop is limited to HDFS. I'm not really sure about that, so I'm still iffy about that part. So, yeah, it's them and the Crash Stats team that use Hadoop. Right, this is another favorite topic. As much as we hate having a bunch of source control systems, the developers just love having different source control systems. So yes, we have one machine on an IT infra box that uses RCS. Yes, still. Yeah. Who uses RCS? <laughs> well, <laughs> someone set it up and said... It is. <laughs> exactly. Good question. Who uses RCS or who remembers what RCS is? <laughs> but yeah, I think it was just set, uh, it was a simple mail server with an aliases file that is checked in with RCS for some reason. It's just been that way. It'll change. Uh, and then we have CDS. We still have like two repositories in CDS that are active, and we're like trying to get them to move to something else so we can shut down CDS. We have Subversion, which is uh, which actually still has a lot of stuff going on in it, like a lot of the website code and stuff lives on Subversion. It's slowly moving to Git. 
Uh, Mercurial is where the main Mozilla source resides, so that's not going anywhere. Although they'd like to move it to Git, there's a good faction that says we want Mercurial, and there's a good faction that says move it to Git, so till they fight that out, we're just happy doing work. And Bugzilla is the odd one out that lives on Bazaar for some reason. So, yep, we have all this. And if you have any other suggestions, I think our developers will be happy to use that too. <laughs> so, uh, standard data, data center infrastructure, DNS is be done by. Uh, we run 9.7 plus for DNSSEC. That's the only reason. I think the default bind in RGL5 is still not 9.7, but 6 is already 9.7, so we run that. Uh, DHCP, uh, standard Red Hat DHCP install, but what we have done is for the Phoenix data center and everything else moving forward, we've hooked this up to our inventory, so you don't have to hand edit anything when you add a box to inventory, which I'll probably speak about in the next slide, I'm not sure. So we have, well, let me just say that here. We have a little inventory system that keeps track of all our servers and stuff. So when you assign a new machine in inventory, you assign an, uh, an IP to it, and it does all your sanity checks, make sure everything's okay, it writes out the DHCP config, commits it into source control, DHCP servers pull it down from source control, everything just works like magic. You don't have to handle it anything. NDP standard for time. VPN. Uh, uh, hosts, we use OpenVPN again. Our jump hosts have uh, got SSH access on them. Uh, DuckAx plus for the network equipment, uh, which is a mix of Cisco and Juniper. We've moved away from Cisco for all our code routing stuff. That will be the case in the near future. Uh, Cisco simply wasn't scaling fast enough for our needs or for the price we were willing to pay. So. It's all Juniper at this point. Um, we also have the NetApp for storage. I'm not sure about the total size, but I'm sure it's probably somewhere between 15 terabytes, if I remember, per data center, but I'm not sure. We also have Equalogic, Dell's Equalogic, but I don't think we're going to be moving or adding any more to that. The office infrastructure is pretty much the same, but the main difference is uh, LDAP, well, so we have wireless, uh, we have Aruba wireless controllers in the office. So as soon as you try to log into the wireless, it talks to the radius server, which then talks to LDAP to authenticate you and then give you access. That's pretty much the only difference. We use Zimbra for our corporate email. And yeah, December has not been a fun month because of a massive email outage we had for two days. If you're more interested, I can talk about that a little later. And the rest of it is pretty much standard DNS, slaves, DNCD, and apps. So managing all of this, uh, we kickstart our machines. Since most of them are Red Hat, we've got a custom Pixie boot menu. So it displays a matrix with the hardware and the OS. So you just say, number five would install REL6 for a 32-bit machine. And you can specify other information. Inventory that I spoke about is basically there for three things. One source of truth, all the information's in inventory. If you see a machine on the network and it's not in inventory, NetOps will yank that machine from the network because we ran into problems with that. Uh, DHCP information goes into inventory as well. And Puppet basically checks inventory to make sure that this machine should exist before it does anything. So if the machine's not in inventory, Puppet's not going to do anything. It's going to air it out and say, I can't find this machine. And once you've installed the machine, then Puppet is pretty much what we use to manage everything. We've, we've written over 100 modules, which that's the three things there just are, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Does my package management, configs, users, etc. But pretty much what we aim to do is manage extreme, well, pretty much everything with Puppet. So, all the new stuff that we're bringing up, we write puppet manifests and then nothing, nothing gets done by hand. So the big, the big advantage that we found with that is when you have a new sysadmin trying to clean up Apache log files, sorry JLAS if you ever see this recording, uh, and runs a find that then starts deleting slash, 
It's very simple if you have everything configured in Puppet. You just bring up a new machine, you run Puppet, you've got another host there and within, within 20 minutes to do your stuff. So, Sean, um, yeah. how do you check if the machine is in inventory or not? Uh, so, Jason's question was how do you check if the machine is in inventory or not? What we do is inventory has its own MySQL database and the V, I, I don't know, I forget what it's called, but Puppet is allowed to run a script when it starts. And we have a script that runs an SQL query to the database and sees if it can find the host name of the machine we're trying to puppetize. So if it doesn't find that, it then bails out. I forget the exact technical term. Uh, there's, there's something that Puppet runs. So that's the first script Puppet runs every time. You can ask it to do that. Okay. When you run, run this first. So and you, you don't have a problem with rogue machines on your network, right? This is all private data center. Right. He said you don't have problems with rogue machines on your network. That is correct. It is a private data center, but sometimes people make mistakes, plug in machines they're not supposed to, or plug in machines and take an IP address without assigning it in DNS, right. at which point NetOps might have a problem on their hands when they're doing stuff. It's happened before, which is why we have these. Yeah, how do they figure it out? How do they figure out the rogue machine? How do they figure out it's a rogue machine? I assume it took them, I think it took them about an hour and a half, but they had to go look at which machine. Well, they looked at the op routing tables and could see that there was a machine. And there was another machine that was trying to claim the same IP. So I think that's how they finally locked it up. So, monitoring. We've set up all this, and of course, you have to have people and automated monitoring stuff to keep all this running. So, we've got the operations team, which have site reliability engineers on call 24 7. Thanks to them, because the rest of us can sleep and they can have the pager. Not true. Uh, so, here, Ashish here usually takes on call for us 12 hours when he's up here and hands off to the US team for their daytime for the next 12 hours. Um, we pretty much use Nagios for the rest of the stuff. Um, the current install we have is, is sort of a hack. It's got what we call a master install and satellite installs in other data centers. So you can see status of San Jose and Phoenix on websites, but China and stuff get lumped up with San Jose. And I won't go into the details. We're moving to a better setup via Puppet, so everything is like, you lose an Agios master, you don't lose anything, you just bring up another machine, puppetize it, everything just comes back. Uh, Ganglia is pretty awesome, spe especially for trends, because when you're looking at, say, add-ons having an issue, and you'd like to see what happened last week, or how much the traffic was last week, or if you're experiencing a denial of service attack, or you're running out of RAM or CPU, it's a great way to actually look at it visually and you immediately spot the problem. You look at the graph and you're like, okay, that looks suspicious. Which is pretty hard to do with just raw SAR data, for example, because you don't, you know, it's just easier to represent it uh, visually. Um, Graphite is something that the application devs like to use. It's, it's plugged in to most of the Django stuff. So it tells them how much a page load and how much a specific operation takes them. Uh, takes time, what, what amount of time. So that's another thing, if your deployment suddenly increased the page load time, they'll notice in the graphs and tell us to roll back or whatnot. Um, if you look at monitoring continued cacti, NetOps likes cacti, so they still use uh, cacti for all our bandwidth monitoring. And our PDUs in the data center are monitored usually for temperature, so that's on cacti as well. InfraSec uses the next two tools, OSSEC and Audit D. We're rolling out Audit D to make sure, you know, we've got better controls and we've got better logs of what happened on our servers. Right, and more monitoring, because you can't have enough monitoring. Uh, we've got external monitors as well. Uh, we use WatchMouse, uh, which is basically at status.mozilla.com, I think, yeah. And Gomez, which basically alerts us in case it can't load a specific website. So these are limited, well, WatchMouse has a lot of our properties. Gomez is limited to specific stuff like add-ons, and it'll send email to on-call saying, this website is taking more than 15 seconds to load, so please look into it. And it's pretty interesting because Gomez gives you a pretty nice breakdown of 
the location and then how much time each request took and for the entire page to complete. And uh, we also do uh, backups because we've had to depend on them more than once. Uh, Netvault is what we use. So all the, we have a local backup machine in each data center. All the servers that need to be backed up get backed up on that machine. And then from that machine, stuff gets transferred to tape. We also back up MySQL. Uh, we've got a backup server that runs as a slave to another, well, to me not too confusing, it's just replication. And once it's replicated, then we've got that, and then we take a, an SQL dump as well, and then back that up as well. So, a little bit of a plug here. We at Mozilla, if you actually notice, a lot of, well, all, not just a lot, all of our website code is pretty much open. There's nothing that's not open. And we'd like our IT to be the same. And we'd like to get community involvement in IT. We'd like to get community sysadmins. You can volunteer for whatever time you have if you feel like it. So these are some of the URLs you can look at. We all hang out in hash ID on irc.mozilla.org. That's a great place to come and hang out, or ask us if you have any questions, or generally with your setup, or you know, what it is. Uh, we also, I think, have a couple of volunteer roles open at the URL, so you could look at that. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want any more details, if you'd like to look at some of our Gangria graphs, I could probably show you some of that stuff too. Whatever you're interested in. Pictures. Oh yes, pictures. Let me see if I if I can quickly get that from my phone. We're hiding as well, so in case you're interested. And there's some swag as well, there's some stickers and a little carriers at Mozilla hiring sheet in case you guys are interested. I mean, it's just a job description for something we have open right now in case you'd like to look at. Let me find you some pictures. No, I've got this. Can you transfer it? Okay, hey, so that's the SCL1 data center. That's my colleague Xander. Let me just quickly back up. And where he's standing is that whole row. That's seven rows of Mac minis. And uh, to, his, to the left, all these machines are IX machines. And that's the networking equipment. Uh, the uplink from the provider, that's the Juniper SRX firewalls and stuff. And here we are since you're sitting and working or not. And that's the, that's not our equipment, that's just some other random stuff that Ashi shot. I have no that's idea about. Ah, okay, let's skip. And that's the back side, if you, can, if you can see that. That's all the power supplies of all the minis. And we were, I, I think at this point, we were trying to debug 8G and why it wasn't working on that local and stuff. You have any more videos? Or? No. OK. So that was, that's pretty much uh, SEL2. I probably have some pictures on the phone, but.
okay. Um, yeah, so. So those are the minis, and if you actually notice these dongles here, that's because the Mac Mini will not boot up without a monitor connected to it. So we <laughs> we have a VGA cable with uh, the correct pins shorted out for the specific with the required resistors, and we fool the Mini into thinking that it's plugged into a monitor and it boots up. And in fact, all these racks that you see. Uh, that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's Xander, by the way. Uh, those eight racks, uh, we spent uh, pretty much eight hours completely stripping them down and redoing them to look nice and, you know, and also to be ordered. So each of these racks, so the first time when they were set up, they were set up in a rush. And so the first rack, say, would have all of the Win64 machines. So if you lost the rack, you'd lose all of the Windows 64 machines, which wasn't a good thing. So we then split it across rows. So the first row would be Win64, the second would be, say, Linux 64, third would be 32-bit Windows, and so on, Mac, and so on. So every rack would have unique stuff. So it's like you won't lose all your things if you lose a rack. So that's pretty much it. I don't think I have any more data center pictures on this one. So, any questions? Yeah, so, why did you use this and not the Excel machines? Apple makes server racks, right? Or at least they used to. Right, so Jason's question is why did you use this and not the Excel machines? I think the primary reason was cost. The minis are 499 500 bucks at most. Mm -hmm. Not sure. But yeah, that's a major factor. X, this X servers are nowhere close to that. So, you're saying that you can get up a cluster of minis and they actually give you better performance in Excel. Right, so each of the minis are probably doing one thing at a specific point of time. So they open up Firefox, they're running automated tests to do stuff, to see what the performance is like. And that's it. So you could max out your, it, you could totally max out the core to cluster, run whatever you need to, quit, restart again for the next build with something else. So, I don't think, so yeah, I don't think you really need that kind of performance thing. I don't think it really makes an impact. Um, well, just, uh, um, since I'm here, I'll show you some trending stuff in case. No, not that. <laughs> I blame Yahoo for that one. So that, for example, would be the load balancer cluster. And as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, all of these machines are Blade servers with a one gig network interface on them. ZLB07 is a beast. It's got four 10 gig mix and it's basically pretty much doing nothing. I think 08 is the same. We ordered new servers to replace all these ones. So all the Blade servers with uh, one gig mix are the ones seeing issues at this point. They're on a higher than normal load average. But yeah, that's pretty much the reason. Let's see what add-ons looks like at this point. And we do have some custom database checks that I can probably show you. And oh, that's interesting. Ah. So you've got. Oh, we 
Yeah. File a bug. Drop me on the San Jose cluster. Let me see if I have that in the hospital. Yeah, we bought uh, Phoenix online only mid this year, so that's pretty much the amount of memory we've thrown at this. So, yeah, any questions, any other things you'd like to talk about? So, what was the last graph? This is basically total what he asked me what the last graph was. Uh, memory usage across all the AMO web heads, add ons got personal log. So across 30 machines, total memory usage. Why is it jump? Oh, that's because uh, July and August were when these machines were installed. And then it was commissioned in September. And you can see that jump. And then as the traffic went up, that's why you see that. Yeah. So this was the a very initial install, no traffic testing phase. And this is all production traffic phase, pretty much. And I think those two spikes there were pretty much attacks, as you can see. All Ganglia has a bug that I'm not aware of. Let's look at something a little smaller. See if it makes more sense. Say last month. Yeah. That's pretty much. If you notice, you'll see correlations like Mondays and people coming back from holidays and there are spikes when they open up Firefox to check and it hits add-ons to check for new versions of add-ons and stuff, so you'll actually see that, yeah.
so that's the main when it loads the crash stat website and for the last 7 days these are the number of crashes per 100 daily active users and if you ever want to see your own individual crash stat you can probably do about crashes and you can select a crash report which then looks up the corresponding report and opens it. So that's what your actual crash record looks like. This is all public information. There might be, if you've submitted identifying, identifying information like your email and stuff, that's not public here. Only the developers with specific approved access can actually contact you so they can look at your email. So this is the whole trace and it's, there's the raw dump, there's the modules that you're invoked and what exactly happened. If, it, if your crash is common enough, there is, as you can see, last crash more than 3 months and then 1.9 days since I installed this version. Over here you'll actually see a link to the bugs that are similar. This one doesn't have any other crashes so it's not reported. But if there are other crashes then you can probably see them there. question is what do you do with all the crashes. So basically uh, the ones that are critical in terms of you are crashing hundreds of browsers, developers immediately look at it, especially if you are on Aurora, which is, so basically we now have three channels, I don't know if you are aware of that, we've got Nightly, which is like just pure development stuff, then stuff, stuff that goes from Nightly goes into something called Aurora which is what I'm running. This is this is basically a lot of and uh, if if there's stuff if there are problems uh, with stuff on Aurora, they will definitely look at it. Developers look at it. They have triage sessions. They look this is a very important tool for developers to see where the browser is crashing. And it's very easy to spot trends that they make a fix, they make a release and then it suddenly spikes. The graphs will just go up. They look at it and trust me as much as people believe nothing happens, people actually look at it. Not all the crashes, because there's just way too many of them. But the people do look at it, people do fix issues that are reported here. So, yeah, that's pretty much the bird's eye view of what happens. Stuff here. What about Do you test them also on the same machines? Uh, the question was, what about Fennec? Do you test them on the same machines? No, Fennec gets tested on devices. Uh, unfortunately, I do have a picture of that as well somewhere on the laptop. So we used to, initially when we built Fennec, it used to run on the NA10. And we used to have an array of uh, NA10 devices that would automatically keep running Fennec and performing stuff. In our Mountain View office, we also have, uh, it, we, we call it Haxor, H-A-X-X-O-R. It's basically a Faraday cage, which has all the mobile devices. 
So it's got an eight. I don't think we still do stuff on the eight tens. Pictures. Ah, uh, let me let me let me. Pictures. <laughs> let me try to pull up the N810. I'm sure it's on my Flickr, so I can pull that up. So this, that was the very first NA10 test build we had and it used to be really funny seeing all of them like you know reboot, start up Fennec and then run a bunch of tests, shut down, reboot, done stuff. But this was as you can see April 2009. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff similar to this. All the mobile stuff sits on IKEA racks inside that room. Unfortunately, I don't think I've taken a picture of that, so that's pretty much what it does. So yeah, these, these things get tested on devices, not on the, the usual. That, that's only the desktop stuff that gets tested on the Mac Minis and profiled. That doesn't look oh, like a Faraday cage. Well, no, that's not a Faraday cage. That was made before the Faraday cage. <coughs> uh, let me actually Google. I'm sure someone's put a picture. Hang on. Side of it, but that's definitely the outside. And so that's a pretty, pretty heavy door, and you can run out of air inside. So there's a big emergency red button on the other side that says, "If you're stuck, hit the button," and it'll basically blow out these hinges, so you can just the door just falls down, and you can walk out. So that's pretty much.
Yes, anything else? Uh, no, no more questions for me. I would love to see what's inside. I, would, yeah, I know, I, I would have happily showed it to you, but it, let, me, let me see if I can find a better picture. But. Okay, uh, who's awake and wants a sticker? <laughs> the rest of you is not listening or not interested? It's a nice dark place and it's a cold night, so it's... <laughs> and my voice is not that pleasing, I'm sure. It's quite soothing. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, guys.